Hi, I'm Brandi Heflin. I'm a personalized physics instructor, and I help high school and college students feel confident and successful in learning physics. Today, I'm bringing you part four of my data handling and interpretation video series. In part one, we learned about interpreting slopes and intercepts of linear data. In part two, we learned about graphical relationships and the process of linearization. In part three, we learned about constructing a mathematical model for a given measured data set. And today, we're going to pull it all together. This is a simple lab. I call it the circles lab. We're going to experimentally determine pi. So I've walked you through here my process for the data collection and analysis, and then also provided some teacher talk in case you want to replicate this in your own classroom. At some point, we all learned, whether it was middle school algebra or high school geometry, the following relationships for circles. C equals pi times D, or circumference equals pi times the diameter of the circle, and A equals pi R squared, where A is the area and R is the radius. Notice that both of these relationships look an awful lot like a dependent variable equals a slope multiplied by an independent variable with an intercept of zero. The ancient Greeks noticed that all circles have a circumference that's approximately three times its diameter, and people have refined that value over time. Pi has an approximate value of 3.14. You can uh, often find a pi button on scientific and graphing calculators, and if I don't have that and I'm going to do a calculation with pi, I use a slightly more precise value of 3.14159. We now know that pi is an irrational number that cannot be expressed as a simple fraction, and it's a never-ending, non-repeating decimal, and we currently know pi to about a million digits. We can experimentally determine a value for pi by measuring the diameter and circumference of a variety of circular objects, plot circumference versus diameter, and then get the slope of the best fit line. And for good practice of our new linearization skills, we're also going to measure the area of our circular objects, plot area versus radius, which is of course half the diameter, and then we're gonna to have to linearize it as area versus r squared, and we'll get the slope of that best fit line. Both of these slopes, as we saw a few slides ago, should turn out to be around 3.14. So here are the stars of our show. We have the hula hoop, which is the largest circular object. We have the top of this um, brown table. We have a serving tray. We also have the circular top of this stool. We have plastic plates. We have a silver cookie tin. We have a Lifesavers tin that used to have Lifesavers in it once upon a time. We have a Tootsie Roll tin that once upon a time had Tootsie Rolls in it. And then we have uh, a spool of thread. Its ends are, of course, circular. And last but not least, we also have a sewing bobbin. Um, this is a piece that goes on a sewing machine and has some extra thread. Um, you know, when you look at the seams of clothing, you often will have a thread on the outside and then thread on the inside. And the bobbin uh, on a sewing machine helps put the thread along the inside um, when you're making a, a hem. So to measure, measure the circumference, we're going to need some flexible tape measures. Um, you can often find these in the fabrics or crafts aisle at major department stores. Um, and uh, then, of course, stores um, that specialize in, in crafts will have them. And that was only one kind. That one was retractable. This one um, is a standard long tape measure. Um, it is 60 inches in length. I realize that's reversed for you. Or... Uh, it goes out to 150 centimeters, and I don't know if you can actually read that. Um, this one is a little bit longer than usual, um, but they come in yellow and white, and they're not that expensive. And so to measure uh, our circumference, um, we can pretty easily uh, wrap 
our measuring tape just around the outside um, of the object. And of course, since this is a scientific experiment, we should really use the metric system. I don't know if you can tell that I still had it on English. So we just wrap around the outside. Uh, for the larger objects, uh, it's going to take more than one tape to get all the way around. So you can either um, tape multiple measuring tapes together, or you can, you know, if you're working by yourself or with friends, you can tape one end in place, take the tape as far around as it's going to go, and um, mark where the end of the tape is, the final measurement on the tape, and then untape the the beginning end of the tape and place it at the end. Obviously, this is easier to do if you have multiple people um, like you would in a science class lab, but I, of course, executed this by myself. And for the diameter, it can be difficult to measure the widest point on the circle. And my workaround for that is that since we're going to measure the area too, we're going to trace each object on graph paper and we can tape together multiple pieces as needed. And it's a lot easier then to use a ruler or meter stick to measure the widest point. So let's talk for a moment about this graph paper. Um, there are lots of different kinds besides the standard one quarter inch paper that you, you know, usually find in science and math classrooms. Um, I have a kind of paper that has um, one inch dark blue markings and then each of the smaller markings is a tenth of an inch. I also have a paper um, that is 20 divisions per inch instead of 10 on the previous kind. Uh, one of the schools that I worked in um, had some pads of paper that is um, 10 markings for every centimeter. And I really prefer to use um, a, a metric system paper, but you can work this in the English system. Um, and then every dark marking on this paper is one centimeter. But the kind that I actually used um, was this kind that had um, five markings for every centimeter. So um, each dark line is one centimeter apart, and then uh, each of the, the lighter lines is two millimeters apart. Um, and in fact, what I did was pop this into um, my home printer that can make copies and I just made um, lots of paper copies that I could write on um, cut up as needed like to cut off the margins to tape together multiple pieces um, really nicely so I have some images for you coming up of the process so even for the large objects I could tape together multiple pieces of paper and trace around like I did here for the table and it's a little bit hard to see the circle um, on the image that shows the meter stick to get the diameter. So um, I've placed, uh, you know, an artificial circle here in the uh, video tool to make it easier for you to see. And um, I was able to take a meter stick and move it along the edges and actually find the widest point of my circle um, fairly easily this way. And something really interesting that I noticed is that um, the measurements weren't exactly the same going side to side versus up and down on the circular objects. And I have more to say about that. It actually has to do with having photocopied the graph paper, but you will definitely want to check out for yourself um, and make sure that um, you know, your objects aren't um, slightly elliptical. Um, so here's the same table being measured up and down instead of side to side. And then I also saw when I took an overhead shot of my hula hoop <laughs> that my hula hoop is not actually perfectly circular. Um, that's not going to affect the diameter too much, um, but that, that will have an impact on the area that gets measured. So once you've measured circumference and diameter for all of the objects, and I have that data coming up, you will next want to calculate the radius as half the diameter. And um, to get the area using this one centimeter square graph paper, it's fairly easy. So for the partial squares, um, you know, you can see in the image here, this is zoomed in on um, 
the tracing for one of the smaller objects, you can see um, that I have put in each whole centimeter, and I'm not outlining them very well, I apologize for that. In each whole centimeter, I went ahead and wrote the number to count how many whole square centimeters there are, and this one had 20. And for the smaller objects, you can also match up uh, um, the segments that will complete each other is the best way to say it. And that's what I've done here and here. Um, the filled in area underneath square 20 sort of matches up nicely with the empty area above um, this square that I think I marked uh, 21. And likewise, um, I chose another pair where I color coded to help fill, uh, you know, point them out that um, the gap right here above 22 actually matched pretty nicely with um, this segment here inside the circle. So that's how I got scores 21 and 22. And then, of course, I also went across the circle to match up and be able to get estimates of whole centimeters. And then the next step that I took, um, also with the color coding, because I love color coding and it makes things really easy to keep track of, I then took each segment that was not a whole uh, square centimeter and counted the um, small boxes inside and then also took an estimate of um, any partial small boxes that would add up to be whole boxes. I didn't go any more precise than half of a small box because half of a small box, uh, if you recall, two millimeters by two millimeters is four millimeters. So half of a box is going to be um, two square millimeters. It's really small. Um, but then over here with my color coding, I noted that the one I just outlined in blue was 12. And then uh, this next one over here in uh, pale green that I'm about to trace um, had a value of about 16 when I counted it up for a total of 28 for that row. And then I just went across row by row, outlining, counting and outlining in color and recording in that same color how many small boxes that I'd had and then got a final count of how many small boxes. And I'll talk a little bit more um, about the calculation for that on the next slide. For the smaller objects, you don't have a choice but to use the small boxes. Um, like notice here, this was the bobbin and this was the spool of thread. Notice that the bobbin didn't even include one square centimeter box. So all I could do was count up small boxes and partial boxes. Um, and then once you have the count, here's that 130 that we just saw um, I think that was for the Tootsie Roll 10. Um, I had my, you know, 23 whole squares and then, uh, or maybe it was 24 whole squares. And then I could take that 130 and multiply it by 0 0.04 um, square centimeters for every box, because of course there are 25 small boxes inside every square centimeter. And so that plus the whole, square centimeters um, that I'd previously counted would give me a pretty good estimate of the area. Um, and you can see here my process. Um, I did the same thing all over here for that uh, Lifesavers 10. And I think I have a zoom in of that data set coming up too, just to make it a little bit easier to see. Um, when you get up to the larger object objects, you won't have to be quite as precise. So for the larger objects, um, I'm definitely not going to end up really counting like all of the tiny squares. Um, go ahead. I went ahead and filled in um, every square centimeter 
And you can see here that I actually used different colors. I switched colors every 100. And boy, did it take a long time to write that in. It made my hand cramp. So I recommend a different process as you keep going up to larger and larger circles. I did here, um, this picture was taken before I handled, you know, each, oh no, I wanted to draw, not move my picture, hang on. Um, you can see like here I have this area and um, like this one here. So this image was taken before I went through and calculated all of that um, for this object. So for the bigger objects, I recommend writing the count for the first whole square in each row and the last whole square, and then every multiple of five in between. Um, and that's why you can see all of these open gaps in this image because I didn't write in every count. Just the first row, every five, and then the last count for each row. And then I still, and you can see a lot more clearly here um, where I, let me click draw really quickly. Okay, you can see a lot more clearly here where I might have or did actually, you know, outline. I outlined two boxes there, but every partial circle went ahead and counted and outlined and recorded over here. And then here was the tally for each row. And all the way down here is the tally for that object. It was very time consuming. And I have some teacher talk coming up on how to make this efficient in a classroom. So clearly you don't want your students to be spending all of this time on this. It worked for me to make this demonstration video. I didn't mind. I actually um, unfortunately lost all of my electronic files um, in the time since I stopped teaching. And so I didn't have this data saved somewhere even though I had recorded it when my classes did this lab when I was teaching. So what I recommend is have a variety of small objects, the ones that will fit on a single piece of paper, um, have a variety for the groups to measure and have it, every group do at least three of your smaller objects. For the objects that are gonna take maybe two pieces of paper taped together this way, perhaps a third one down, um, have each group measure one of those objects. Have five or six total for the class each group measures one and then shares the data with everybody. And then for these larger objects, um, like the hula hoop, the table, the stool, um, you don't have to do something like a tabletop and a stool. It's okay to stop with something the size of a plate. Um, but I do like having the hula hoop included. All the larger objects that are really time consuming, measure those yourself and then share that with the class. And also teacher talk. Um, be careful that your students don't calculate circumference and area once they've measured diameter and radius. Um, make sure that they are actually measuring the circumference. Make sure that they are tracing on graph paper and counting the boxes for the area um, because otherwise that defeats the purpose of the lab. So on to the fun part. Here is the data I collected for my 10 items. And I'll give you a moment to look it over. Notice the astounding range of those areas from 3.2 square centimeters for my bobbin all the way up to nearly 4,700 square centimeters for the hula hoop. Um, those larger objects were really time consuming. Um, and I'm so glad that I don't ever have to measure them again um, because I've now um, save this data in the cloud so that um, it's recorded once. So here's our plot of circumference versus diameter. Notice that that looks like it's going to be a straight diagonal line. And sure enough, when we put in a best fit line, we get a slope of uh, 3.1781 centimeters for every centimeter because of course we always put units on our um, slopes of trend lines. And so this equation is saying that the circumference of a circle is equal to 3.1781 centimeters for every centimeter times the diameter of the circle. And then 
let's talk about this right here, this intercept. So we know that an object with no diameter I think I'll have enough room for that. Won't have a circumference, right? When diameter let me make that a little bit prettier. Okay. There's when their diameter is zero, you're not gonna have an ability to measure around the object. So we can uh, disregard um, this intercept. Um, this is one of the things that we can do when we interpret slopes and intercepts is, uh, you know, that intercept is just a feature of the best fit, the linear regression process that the software took, and it doesn't have a basis in reality. So we would be um, perfectly justified in reporting this as C equals 3.1781 centimeters for every centimeters just times the diameter. And now when we plot area versus radius, not surprisingly, we get a top opening parabola. And, um, you know, we already know that area equals pi r squared. So we already know that uh, we're going to linearize by squaring the radius and making a new plot. And when we do that, we get um, this gorgeous straight diagonal line. And in this case, we got a slope of uh, 3.1905 centimeters squared per centimeter squared. And again, let's interpret, oops, hang on. I didn't want to move the image. I wanted to draw. Um, so let's talk about this again, this slope of negative eight point something square centimeters doesn't really make sense in the physical context. It's a, it's a feature of the, the plotting software because we know when radius equals zero centimeters, the area should be zero, right? That an object that has no radius won't have an area So we will um, disregard that intercept as well. And we can report this relationship as 3.1905 centimeters squared for every centimeters squared times the radius squared. So one of the things that I really like about this as an introductory lab is that you have a known result and you can really easily compare your experimental results to the answer that you know that you should get. And 3.17 and 3.19 are not that far off, but not as close as I remember getting um, with my students. And I did notice some sources of systematic uncertainty or error. Um, as I said, I took, you know, the one centimeter graph paper from a kit and, you know, basically made photocopies of it in my home printer and it didn't actually print straight. Um, the long direction stretched about a millimeter for every 10 centimeters. So in other words, um, the line at 20, centimeters on my paper was closer to 20.2 centimeters along a ruler. And that means that when I tape multiple rows of paper together for the bigger objects, 40 centimeters um, was at 40.4 centimeters along a meter stick and so on. I also noticed that um, the two edges of the paper had different lengths. One of these was 24.15 centimeters on a ruler, but the other edge was 24.25 centimeters. Um, 
And I also discovered Side to Side. Luckily, Side to Side was not too affected. Um, this should be 18 centimeters across, but both top and bottom measured, um, I think it was like 17.9 with a ruler. So you, I don't, didn't have that problem with the copying that I did on like an actual copier when I did this with students, but it certainly um, affected my results here. And so for consistency, I used the measurements on the paper for diameter. I used the measurements on the paper for um, the area as well. I did not use measurements from a ruler or meter stick um, just, just to help keep what I was using for the area um, as one square centimeter consistent with the linear centimeters um, that I was measuring. And then um, that crookedness in the printing uh, with the difference in the lengths on the two sides also meant that when I had two rows of paper that I taped together for the bigger objects, um, there was a gap of about a millimeter um, because the edges would be aligned, but then in the middle, it didn't line up. And so there was a, actually a gap. Um, you know, I would trim off the um, margins and then try, I would tape together my whole row. Um, I actually had to, you know, sort of like flip flop so that like the slightly longer side was with the slightly longer side and the slightly shorter side was against the slightly shorter side. Um, and that meant that, yeah, it introduced some not perfectly straight across a whole length of paper um, line. And so, you know, I didn't try to account for that when I was counting, but, you know, it's not that big a deal for a small object, but on those bigger objects, um, you know, that can start to add up. So I hope you have enjoyed this conclusion of the data interpretation and analysis and handling video series. And teachers, feel free to reach out to me if you decide to do this lab. Um, you know, I no longer have handouts, unfortunately, but I can certainly help guide you to resources and have ideas and talk with you about what kinds of circular objects did I have my classes measure. So if you'd like to connect further, you can reach me at brandyhefflinphysics at gmail.com. You can also visit my website, virtualphysicsofficehours.com, where you can schedule a free needs assessment to claim your free first one-hour session, and you can also check out additional free help options. You can also find me on Facebook at Physics Tutor Brandy. I love physics, and I love helping you. Until next time.